Can pigeons read? This one gives every indication because he's been taught to distinguish between two words and to behave appropriately. He's learned his different response to each sign by being rewarded with food. So the bird isn't acting independently. Its behavior is shaped by controlling its environment. The first task was to isolate an individual piece of behavior and see how that could be changed. Skinner did this by keeping individual pigeons at about three quarters of their normal weight so that the birds were always hungry and food could be used as an automatic reward. The pigeon was studied in a uniform box, one it quickly grew used to. One piece of behaviour, pecking a coloured disc, was measured on a graph. The pigeon learned that pecking the disc produced a reward. Then the behaviour of pecking could be studied in relation to how often that reward was offered, or in Skinner's terms, what was the schedule of reinforcement? The main thing is what, what we call schedules of reinforcement. Reinforcement is what the layman calls reward, and you can schedule it uh, so that a reward occurs every now and then when a pigeon does something. We usually use a response with a pigeon pecking a little disc, a little spot in the wall, and you can reinforce with food. But you don't reinforce every time, you every, perhaps every tenth time, or perhaps only once every minute or something like that. There are a very large number of, of schedules and they have their uh, special effects. And there is a good example of how you can move from uh, the, uh, the pigeon to the human case, because one of the, one of the schedules which is very effective with, with rats or pigeons is what we call a variable ratio schedule, and that is at the heart of all gambling devices and has the same effect. The pigeon can become a pathological gambler just as a person can. Now, the fact that we found that out with pigeons and could prove it by removing and changing the schedule makes it easy for us to interpret the case with, with the, human, the human subject. We, we don't say that the, the human subject uh, gambles to punish himself, as the Freudians might say, or gambles because he feels excited when he does so. Nothing of, nothing of the sort. People gamble because of the schedule of the reinforcement that follows. And this is true of all gambling systems. They all have variable ratios built into them. So what we've learned from the pigeon, it made it possible to interpret this vast field very effectively. Where does that leave free will? Because we all think we have a choice whether to do things or not to do things. Yes. Well, you see, we, it leaves it in the position of, of a fiction. We, we have uh, assumed somehow or other that these internal states, feelings, and so on, have initiated something. They have started something. They have created. We, 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 we have done something in, vo in a voluntary way. We have willed to act. If you now look at the actual history, we find that there are external reasons why this has happened. In other words, by discovering the causes of behavior, we, we can dispose of the imagined internal cause. We dispose of free will as a, an American divine of the 18th century, Jonathan Edwards, did. He said, we believe in free will because we know about our behavior, but not about its causes. And of course, it's, a sci it's, it's the, the object of a science of behavior to discover causes. And once you have found those causes, there is less you need to attribute to an internal act of will, and eventually, I think, you need to attribute nothing to it.